Welcome to The Porch. I'm Richard Grund. This is where we get back to basics, the red letter basics. We examine the Word of God, especially the Book of Acts Church, see how the early church served the Lord. Porch Online Bible Study has been on the air for over a decade, actually, since um, 2010. So it's over a decade. I'm good at math. I really am. It takes a deeper look into how they served the Lord and served the kingdom of God. And our desire has always been to find and restore the priesthood of the believer and regain the world-shaking influence that the early church had. We believe that it's needed right now in 2023. So we dig deeper into Scripture, and we find the church the Lord intended, not the one man created, and follow their example. The church age is not over. What took place in the upper room is as much for today as it was on the day of Pentecost. If you want the fire, it's there for you. And if you know that there's more to your spiritual walk with Yeshua, with Jesus, and you want more, then you're welcome to join us on this journey as we get back to basics. If you have any questions, go to firefalltalkradio.com, use the contact button, or write us directly at the porch, lowercase, one word, at firefalltalkradio.com. If you'd like to support what we do here, and we hope that you would, go to the main page on firefalltalkradio.com. There are ways to do so. We appreciate your support and encouragement, and welcome to all of our listeners from the various streaming platforms. If you need prayer or you want to pray for others in the porch community, just reach out and let us know, and we will get you on the list and give you a list. Not a shopping list, but a prayer list. And make sure you subscribe to us wherever you listen, as well as on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and and Instagram. We're also on YouTube under the Firefall Network. As I said, a new testimony went up. A new one will be coming, plus some more videos that uh, we have planned. So we're going to be doing more of that as well. So, Father, we praise you for the ability to do this, to come together all over the world, all over the United States, wherever we're listening from, whether live right now or archived later. We are your children, and we come together as your children to say, Abba, Father, Papa, God, Daddy, we love you. And we will boldly approach that throne of grace and mercy as your children because we want to be close to you. And we know that you want to be close to us because you sent Yeshua to die for us so that could happen. And we're thankful that you did. Lord, thank you. Thank you for enduring the cross, the shame, the pain, everything that went with that day in Jerusalem on Calvary. Everything you allowed man to do to you so that we could be reconnected to the Father. And then you sent back your Holy Spirit to walk with us, to teach us, to guide us, to remind us of your word to expound upon and enlighten the Word, bring revelation, the gifts, the fruit of the Spirit, all those things that we need to do what you've called us to do. So we pray right now, Lord, we praise you for all that we have. I praise you for everything I have, my salvation, my home, my family, my furry kids, all the things that you've given us, we praise you for right now. We thank you. We pray for you to touch us and to enlighten us and to heal us and deliver us because we want to serve you in fullness and in power. And we can't do that if we're sick, injured, broken, heart, mind, body, soul, or spirit, any way, touch us right now. Touch your children, Lord. And Holy Spirit, bless the technology. Send your angels to guard us and have your way. Open up the hearts and the minds. Clear the minds of all the cares of this day. Take your thoughts captive. Receive the word of God. And let's get ready to shake this world one last time for the return of the king. And I pray all these things in Yeshua's name. 
Amen. These lessons are proprietary information, except where noted the information comes from outside sources. The combination of that information, the matter presented, is exclusive, cannot be repeated or used without permission. The date of this broadcast serves as the registered date of the following information. Okay, get those Bibles open. Uh, however you listen, however you follow, get ready. We're still talking about the calling. Let's live entirely submissive to the will of God. That's what I said last week. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. You and I are chosen and faithful and called. And so the question is, are you with him, and will you answer the call? We're going to talk about that tonight. Somebody who resisted the calling. The the Dictionary of Bible Themes says a calling is God's summoning of individuals and people to himself so that they will belong to him and serve him in this world. The calling of a believer may involve a specific place, a task, or a vocation in life. Holman Bible Dictionary says in the Old Testament, the word call carries several dominant connotations. This includes to name, to summon, to proclaim, to cry out to God for help, and to choose. Well, that's what we're going to talk about. God choosing, calling Jonah to a specific assignment. So we're going to be in the book of Jonah. What was the clue? The name Jonah. Jonah, personal name meaning dove, Jonah ben Amiti, was a prophet of Israel from Gath Hefer, a village near Nazareth. He prophesied during the time of Jeroboam. Rewind. Jeroboam the second from seven ninety three to seven fifty three B.C. And what's amazing, in contrast to what we're going to talk about now, was God had earlier given Jonah the privilege of delivering. Good news that Israel would experience a time of safety and prosperity in 2 Kings 14, verse 25. He restored the territory of Israel from the entrance of Hamath to the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he had spoken through his servant Jonah, the son of Amati. He was the prophet from Gath Hefer. That's what Scripture says, but This time, God's going to use Jonah against his will to deliver a warning to the pagans in Nineveh. Now, this Bible study is inspired by my grandson Jason's viewing habits. Yes. Um, Jesse has been exposing him to the Bible on YouTube. There's something called Superbook. We actually watched an episode With Jason recently, if you have little children, you might consider sharing it with them, super book. But Jonah resisted God's call to go to Nineveh. He didn't want to do it. So let's go to Jonah, chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amiti. I don't know why I can't say that word. Um, Saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, And cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Like no hesitation here. Jonah, remember his name means dove, which is a symbol of peace did not want Nineveh to have peace. He didn't want to cry out against it. He didn't want to warn them of God's impending judgment. So he gets on a ship to get as far away from the calling as possible. Now the city of Nineveh 
is 500 miles away from where Jonah lives on the Tigris River. It's the capital of ancient Assyria and dates back to the early 8th century B.C. Nineveh was founded by Nimrod shortly after the flood. We see that in Genesis 10. And it settled as the capital of the Assyrian Empire, and it rose to power about 900 B.C. And they were a brutal enemy of Israel that would later destroy Samaria and deport its citizens. Now, when the Lord says their wickedness, somewhat of an understatement. Nineveh was an especially evil, vicious city. The Assyrians were, were brutal. They, they were cruel. They skinned their captives alive. The prophet Nahum talks about them as lions tearing and feeding on the nations in Nahum 2. In Nahum 3, a hundred years before Jonah, He speaks out a word against Nineveh. Woe to the bloody city. It is as full of lies and robbery. It is all full of lies and robbery. Its victims never depart. The noise of the whip and the noise of rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of clattering chariots. Horsemen charged with bright sword and glistening spear. There is a multitude of slain and a great number of bodies, countless corpses. They stumble over the corpses. Because of the multitude of harlotries of the seductive harlot, the mystery of sorceries who sells nations through her harlotries and families through her sorceries, behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. These these were evil, demonic people. And it's it's amazing how the enemy can get into a group of people to do the, the disgusting things that Nineveh did to its captives. See, they worshiped the vicious god Ashur, a local deity that had been elevated to national worship. His attributes were drawn earlier from Sumerian and Babylonian deities. So he was at once a god of war, god of wisdom, justice, agriculture, and kingship, among others. Its symbols were the winged sun disk. You've seen it in various friezes and and, uh, statues and pictures. Another symbol was a bull, and yes, it was a lot of bull, and the multitude of other gods and goddesses, goddesses, including Ashtarth with Jezistar, which is eventually all the way down to Jezebel. These are all the same entities. These are all the same demons. I mean, they would impale their enemies on stakes in front of their towns and hang their heads from the trees in the king's gardens. They tortured the captives, men, women, or children, by hacking off individual body parts one at a time. And as it stated, they would cover the city wall with skins of their victims. And you didn't rebel in Nineveh because you'd be massacred by the hundreds, sometimes burned at the stake and their skulls placed in a giant pile by the roadside as a warning to others. So I get it. I get that Jonah doesn't want to do this. So he decides he'd rather quit the prophetic ministry than to preach to such people. So Nineveh is 500 miles east of where he lives. So he gets on a boat going to Tarshish, which is Spain, to travel 2,000 miles in the other direction. But here's what Jonah learned. You can run from the calling, but you can't hide. Romans eleven twenty nine, for God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. He never withdraws them once they are given, and he does not change his mind about those to whom he gives his grace to or whom he sends his call. So what does the Lord do? He sends a violent storm against the ship that Jonah is on. Now they're trying to figure out who did this, and he's on a ship with Phoenicians. This is Phoenician sailors flying, flying, 
sailing out of Jaffa. So they cast lots to figure out what's causing this, and they figure out that it's Jonah. Jonah is the reason for this storm. So he suggests the only answer is to throw him overboard to save their lives. Pick it up, verse 5. The mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God, and they threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. Jonah's cost these people some money by his disobedience. But Jonah has gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, has laid down, and is fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise and call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. And then they said to him, Please tell us, for what cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and and what people are you? These people are frantic. The ship's going to go down, and so Jonah says, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What? Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So if you're going to run from God, don't tell anybody. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. It was getting worse. And he just simply says in verse 12, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will be calm for you, for I know that this great great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord. Remember, Phoenicians are now crying out to Jonah's Lord. It says, we pray, O Lord, please do not let, let us perish for this man's life and do not charge us with innocent blood for you, O Lord, have done it as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Jonah was so sure that he had successfully resisted the call to go to Nineveh that he's asleep in the boat. They said to him, pray to your God. And we know that Jonah's God is the one true God. And he pretty much says that. I'm a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land, which is in contrast to the gods they worshipped. And these Phoenician sailors had fear. They had awe of the Lord, a piety of his presence, and of obedience to his word. And they knew that Jonah, being disobedient, had caused this problem. Proverbs 1, 7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. You know, Jonah's actions contradicted his words. Most people say they have faith in God, but then they live as if they don't. God, the creator of the universe, is pursuing Jonah. And because God is after Jonah, he's now after these sailors as well, and they had every right to be afraid. When you run from the calling, you don't only affect you. Remember that. Jonah knew that the only way for the storm to stop was for the sailors to toss him overboard. Jonah was ready to die rather than do what God asked him to do. He says, because of me, it's an admission of guilt and somewhat of a sense of resignation. But you know what? Wanting to die in that position... Instead of fulfilling the calling or because you did 
the opposite of what you were supposed to do, you're not alone. 1 Kings 19.4, Elijah, after running in fear from Jezebel, he went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Sadly, I know that feeling. You get to the end of yourself, you have nothing left, and you just want to die. Picking up verse 14. As I said, they prayed, Lord, don't let us perish. Don't charge us with what we're about to do. And then they prayed and they offered sacrifices. And who knows what happened to those sailors afterwards. But it's amazing how they had more grace and compassion for Jonah than Jonah had for Nineveh. Right about now, Jonah needs God's grace as much as Nineveh did. And the only reason they did what they did because they were out of options. They tried to row out of the storm. There was nothing left for them to do. And it's just so amazing, these worshipers of Baal and Ashtoreth, they traced back to Canaan. They considered themselves Canaanites. But yet they worshiped the Lord and sacrificed to him. They became a byproduct, a positive byproduct of Jonah's disobedience. God will use whatever you do for his purpose. He will glorify himself, and he will finish what he begins. Psalm 10, Psalm 103. I'm sorry, my brain just... Went someplace else, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I was thinking about those men. They're in the midst of a situation in which is not of their making. Because one of God's children has been disobedient, has not done what he's been told to do. And in essence, Jonah's failure and his witness leads them to worship the Lord God of Israel and to offer him sacrifices, and to fulfill their vows. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness to children's children. To those who have awe and reverence and godly fear, he shows mercy. So here you have Jonah. He's been thrown into the ocean. More than likely, he's going to drown. But we know from verse 17 that the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. It does not say a whale. It's a sea monster of undetermined origin or identity. And some people will say, well, it's just impossible. Jonah could never be in the belly of a whale. And this is pure fiction. It's an allegory. It's not true. Yeah, with God, all things are possible. And I believe it is true. Because he had prepared and appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah that was the calling. That that fish had a calling. That monster, that sea monster, had a calling to retrieve and contain Jonah because this wasn't a punishment. It was keeping Jonah from drowning because he had something to do. If you have something to do, God's going to pursue you. And even when you try to run or quit, been there, done that, he will create a scenario or a situation that gets you back on track. So this sea monster, this fish, in which he's in the belly for three days and three nights, is prepared by God. It's appointed, it's ordained, God's way of intervention to bring about his will. 
And now God has Jonah's attention. He's a captive audience. And the other thing I've learned is that when you try to run or you are disobedient, he will create scenarios to get your attention. Can I get an amen? If you have been through situations with the Lord and he had to do something to get your attention. Chapter 2, verse 1, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly, and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and the flood surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. And then I said, I've been cast out of your sight, Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The water surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. He didn't place him out there gently. He spewed him out because... If you go back and read that prayer, it's somewhat self-serving. It He acknowledges the Lord is God, true believer, even though he's disobedient, and he's called out for his help, and he gets it. But there's no word of repentance or confession of sin, and we're going to see the result of this later. And... He acknowledges the Lord's sovereignty over his life and his need for him, so he affirms his faith and he renews his covenant. He renews his commitment. He's not there yet, though. He will be. But when the Lord offers salvation, salvation is of the Lord. It's the Lord who delivers his people, who delivers his children. It's the Lord God who acts on behalf of his creation and his redeemed community, us believers, is to ensure a relationship with them. Everything God does has a purpose. There's nothing frivolous. He doesn't stutter. He doesn't repeat himself. He doesn't forget what he's done. He's not a practical joker. He's not a man that he should lie. Exodus 15, 2, the Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. Isaiah 12, 2, behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, the Lord, is my strength and song. He has also become my salvation. It's believed that the three days and the three nights allowed the sea monster, the fish, to drop Jonah off right where he started in Joppa. Sometimes you got to go back to the beginning to fulfill the calling. And God will get you there. Interestingly enough, as a note, if you're taking notes, chapter 1 and 2 both end with vows of sacrifice and thanksgiving. Now, let's, let's deal with the, the, the whale in the room. Some scholars doubt the authenticity of the biblical narrative of the book of Jonah. A whale could never do that. A whale couldn't do that. A whale's belly isn't big enough. His mouth isn't big enough. And even if he was, the stomach acids, blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And that's why they're eggheads. But let's see what the Lord says. Matthew 12, verses 39 through 41. This is what the Lord said to them. An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was 
three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation. Something hit me there. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. The Lord puts his stamp on Jonah, the story, the book, and even the person himself because he says one greater than Jonah is here. Well, that'd be an odd comparison to make if Jonah never existed. So let's, let's, let's ignore the eggheads and get on with Scripture. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. You'll get a second chance if you mess up the first one. Saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. A three-day journey in extent, meaning it took three days to get into the heart. That, it, this is a huge city. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. And then he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. It took him three days to walk through the city of Nineveh to deliver a message. Forty days of mercy before judgment. Verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe and covered himself with sack, sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and by his nobles, saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let every one turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent? Turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Then God saw their works that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. One day of preaching, well, three days, but one day in each section, took them three days to get through there. But in each area that heard what he had to say, repentance came. Now, if you notice, the message God gave Jonah to preach didn't explicitly call for their repentance. It just simply told the, the people from Nineveh that they had angered, angered Jonah's God. And of course, they probably recognized that Jonah's a Hebrew and that they have angered the Lord God of Israel and punishment was on its way. And they don't presume that even he could be appeased, but they repented in humility, hoping, quote, that God may yet relent, which he did. God's judgment message was conditional, and that's clear from him telling the prophet, give them 40 days warning. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Interesting thing, another note if you're taking notes. The word they use for God is a general term for a deity. In contrast, the sailors from chapter 1 proclaim their faith in the Lord. They used a personal covenant name for God. Two different reactions. Pretty amazing. 
just like Elijah when he calls down fire and he consumes the sacrifice, the wood and the rocks, and the people start screaming, his God is God. They didn't say their God was God. His God is God. And what's interesting, the fact that they call him an impersonal term for deity might suggest that this conversion, this repentance, is going to be short-lived. And history kind of bears that out because uh, the city was destroyed in 612 B.C. Sometimes that's what happens. The outcome of your obedience is not your responsibility. It's his. You are simply responsible to do what he told you to do when he told you to do it, and how he told you to do it. Don't overthink it. Our problem is we get the paralysis of analysis. Well, how's he going to do that? And what's going to happen if he does do that? And if I say it this way, what are they going to No, like little children, just go do it. No matter how silly, no matter how uncomfortable. You know, and as I worked on this, Today And actually, this has been brewing in my head for a couple of weeks now, ever since um, Jesse told me about Jason watching Jonah. Is that we all have a calling on our lives. Some may be more dramatic than others. Some may be more public than others. But we all have a call, calling, whether it's just to share the gospel. Whatever your calling is, I pray that right now he's stirring it up inside of you. He's reminding you of it. And hopefully you have a different response to its success than Jonah does. Now we get to chapter 4, the final chapter of Jonah. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country, therefore I have fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. It is better for me to die than to live. What? You almost want to hear from heaven. What? But that's not what he says. Verse 4, the Lord says, Is it right for you to be angry? Noah says, I know that you are gracious and a merciful God, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, one from who relents from doing harm. He's quoting what Moses said in Exodus 34. He's quoting the Lord's words right back to him. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him, meaning Moses there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. He knows that the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, great in mercy. Yet Jonah despised the 120,000 inhabitants of Nineveh so much that because God forgave them, he would rather die than live knowing that he had helped them escape that destruction. Let me tell you something. If you're sitting around talking judgment, God's going to do this, and fire is coming here, and he's going to destroy this one, and he's going to destroy that. When I challenge you to show me where in the New Testament that is outside of the Lord's coming in Revelation. That's not our job to speak judgment. A man who caused 120,000 people to be forgiven and to cry out in repentance to the Lord God 
has become angry because his ministry was fruitful. That's another what from heaven. See, Jonah's patriotism, his his zeal for Israel, his hatred for Nineveh, and his prejudice towards them was more important than the souls of the people and the will of God. Now, I don't know why the Lord did what he did, how he did it. Larry and I were talking about this today because decades later, Nineveh's back to being the way it was. Assyria's used by God to destroy Samaria, and they just disappear. They get destroyed. So there had to be, and this is all conjecture. You can't find this in any commentary. This is the Richard Grun commentary on the Old Testament. He had to have a reason. Somebody of that 120,000, maybe more than one somebody, took that message of repentance, stop worshiping the Baals. I don't know, but I know he did it, and I know that it was good. If God does it, it's good. But Jonah, knowing the goodness of God, and did not want Nineveh to know it. But he's kind of hoping it still might happen, so he finds some shade to watch the city. So So Jonah went out of the city, sat on the east side of the city, and there he made himself a shelter, and he sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm. It so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about that plant? And Jonah said, It is right for me to be angry, even to death. Let's face it here. He's throwing a little bit of a tantrum. I got to say, Jonah's a little bit of a brat. But maybe when we get to eternity, we'll, we'll sit down and talk. But the Lord said, You have had pity on the plant for which you've not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. Should I not pity Nineveh? that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock? We want to judge people. But we never think about the fact that they can't discern between right and wrong. They're either demonically bound, they've never been told, and they need somebody to show them. Part of the beginning of forgiveness for me, for my father, who had walked out on us, who was verbally and physically abusive, and other things that I cannot talk about publicly, was understanding that he could only do what he did because of the way he was raised and what was inside of him. We need to see people through the Lord's eyes. We need to see some of the politicians and the musicians and all these people that we speak out against and and condemn, that they are bound, they are deceived, they are confused. You know, the book of Jonah, that was the end. That's how it ends. You never hear about Jonah again. And more than likely... It's because he was done. He finished it. He did his calling. He had, he was probably still a prophet for the Lord, but nothing he did from this point on deserves any mention. And sometimes that happens with the calling. Unfortunately, in 2023, people want to milk the calling. They want to turn it into a business, build a brand. Sometimes you're done when you're done. But the book ends contrasting God's 
mercy, his heart of mercy with Jonah's ungracious heart for Nineveh. I like what the Nelson Study Bible says. By preparing the fish, the plant, and the worm, God made sure that Jonah's mission was not left to chance. God exercised sovereignty not only over the plant and the animal world, but also over Jonah's life, using animals as small as a worm to teach Jonah about his great mercy. Sometimes he has to use the little things. He's sovereign. Folks, your father, your Abba God, your, 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 the one you worship, the Lord, is sovereign. He's sovereign over the forces of nature and the affairs of men. It's his will, his way. And I believe nothing happens unless he allows it. Oh, did you, did you see what happened in the election? Yeah, God allowed it. Stop whining and figure out why he, he allowed it. Maybe that's something to do with worshiping a man other than him. But God's favor is always by grace. It's never deserved. His mercy is his to give, and without it, we're all corrupt, and we all deserve to be condemned. Oh, boy, did, you know, the longer I walk with the Lord, the more powerful that revelation becomes. The more I trip up, the more I fail in the mandate or in, in, in the walk, do I realize how desperate I am for his grace and his mercy. You know what the appropriate response was in this situation? It was joy. Joy is the right response when God lavishes his grace on the vilest of sinners who put their trust in him. I've already told you how people spoke judgment on me because I'd walked out of my family because I was demon-possessed. They didn't see what God was doing. And, as I've said, only one person came back and apologized for the things he had said about me. You don't know what God's doing. Look what they said about Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul. I'm sure the early church condemned him, wanted him dead, hit him with a lightning bolt, burn him up with fire. And God's going, you don't get it. I got a plan for this guy. He's going to evangelize the entire Gentile world. And you want me to set him up in flames. And I don't know if Jonah ever got the point, but he missed it big time. God has compassion for all the nations, not only for Israel. And... As Peter says in 2 Peter 3.9, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Remember when he went to preach in Cornelius' household in Acts 10? After he saw the Spirit fall and they began to speak in tongues and the, and the, and the gifts of the Spirit filled these Gentiles, Romans, Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. You know, if we're going to serve God, it doesn't matter if you're not a prophet. We'll get to that point. If we're going to serve God, We need to value human beings whom he created, and we need to seek their salvation. That should burn inside of you. One of the things that drives me in my prayers, and Larry, when we pray for Firefall, for SRT, for the porch, is to go set the captives free, destroy the work of the enemy, live out Luke 4.18. Not to build buildings, not to become famous and, 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 you know, have a ministry with my name on it. No, no, that won't happen. I'd quit before that happened. But I'm not going to quit because I'm going to do what he called me to do, which was done for me. 
get people saved, healed, and delivered. Because that's the only thing that's going to matter when I stand before him. Not the cars, not the planes, the trains, and the automobiles, or any of those things. Not how famous or how many podcasts did you do or how many films have you made. Nope, nope, nope. Did you make disciples of people? Did you lay hands on the sick? Did you cast out demons? Did you do what I asked you to do? And the other thing we learned from Jonah is we need to acknowledge that God's authority is to do what he pleases. See, Jonah was a reluctant missionary. He was the anti-missionary. He didn't want mercy on Nineveh. He ran. And there's really something humorous about that. How could a prophet of God hide from the creator of the universe? And they believe Tarshish was on the southeast coast of Spain. So he just decided he's going to go to the ends of the earth to not do what he's been asked to do. But there's a frightening part of this, and I kind of mentioned it before. He, being a prophet, was so willing to directly disobey the sovereign God that he placed not only himself, but others connected to him in jeopardy like he did the sailors on that ship. Sadly, Jonah was not on a mission of mercy. He resisted the call. He ran from the presence of the Lord. And and I know I've shared this with you, but when we got to Orlando, I was broken, broken. sat in the office here. I said, Lord, I love you, but leave me alone. I don't want to do this anymore. I want to go back to making movies. I, I just don't want to be in ministry. I don't, want, I don't want this anymore. And he left me alone for about three months. Got him age. Four months. And then he slowly drew me back into ministry. He didn't let me walk away. There were things to be done, people to be saved, Bible studies to be taught. And I'm so thankful he didn't listen to me. And Jonah should be thankful that God didn't allow him to succeed in his effort. God will finish the work that he's begun in you, even if you're reluctant to do it. And as I said, around 740 B.C., just decades after Jonah delivered his warning to Nineveh, God used Assyria to punish Israel for its sins, as shown in 1 Chronicles chapter 5. And by 721 B.C., the Assyrian army had destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel. I don't know why he does what he does. It's not my job to know why. And don't, you know, this whole thing, well, Richard, I'm not a prophet. I don't have that kind of calling, and this really doesn't apply to me. We are called. Royal priest, holy nation, we're God's own people, his possession. And we are called to show others the goodness of God. For he called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You have a testimony. You have a story to tell. You have people to help. I don't know what that entails. But I do know this. We're in a time where the remnant needs to wake up. I'm not expecting the church to wake up. I'm really not. But the remnant needs to wake up. We need to answer the call. We need to put down all the foolish things. We need to stop wanting our name and lights and want people in the kingdom. Lift him up. Let him draw all men to him. Get them saved, healed, and delivered, filled with the Spirit, walking in the gifts, walking in the fruit, shaking this world one last time before the return of the king pushing back against the enemy, shining the light into the darkness, doing what he did 
what the Book of Acts Church did in fulfilling the calling. Stop resisting. Father, Abba, Papa, you are so awesome, merciful, gracious, loving, slow to anger, filled with compassion. I know you saved me. I wouldn't have saved me. And I know there are others listening that feel that way. I ask that you touch them right now. Whatever hinders them from answering the call, remove it. Show them what it is. Heal them of it. Inspire us. Fill us with the fire again. Let us be what you need us to be. Give us what we need to do this, Lord. Unfortunately, we need provision. We need help. Firefall needs help. SRT needs help. Let us go do what you called us and designed us to do. Bless your children. Help them to answer the call. And I pray all these things in Yeshua's name. If you agree with me, just say amen. Here's what I want you to do. Here's your assignment. I don't expect you to let me know, but it'd be nice if you did. Take time. Listen to this again if you have to. Think about Jonah. Think about Nineveh. And search him. What is it, Lord, that you want me to do? No matter how big, no matter how small. Live entirely submissive to the will of God. Remember what it said in Revelation, he is Lord of Lords, King of Kings. And those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. You are called chosen and faithful. Are you with them? Will you answer the call? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Give you shalom. I'm Richard Grun. This has been The Porch on Firefall Talk Radio.